that song was written by Patty Griffin as a response to Dr. King. And it's a reminder that we're all called to go to the mountain top that he experienced. He said he never got to go to the promised land. But so long as we go to that same mountain top, so long as we continue the fight, so long as we, like your pastor said, remember that every month is Women's History Month, every month is Black History Month. One day, I believe, we will get to that promised land. So we gotta go because he asked us to. I wanna thank you uh, for inviting me to uh, speak with you this morning. I wanna thank your minister, <coughs> Reverend Robin, for inviting me. Uh, I actually wanna make sure that you see that I wore my Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, her, her, her dissent, you know, her dissent lace that she wears every time she makes a dissenting opinion. So I wore today in honor of Women's History Month and in honor of International Day of the Women, March 8th. I remember when I first became radicalized about reproductive freedom. I was growing up, 16 years old, in that hotbed of feminism, Topeka, Kansas. <laughs> Wait, I think I misspoke there. That hotbed of misogyny, Topeka, Kansas. And I remember hearing earlier, when I was in junior high, the whispered rumors of a cheerleader in my school who had allegedly gotten pregnant. How she was gone for a few days and how we all smirked knowing what that meant. When she returned to classes, she was quiet. And though we couldn't see it then, looking back, I see that she wore shame like a cloak that covered her whole body, all hunched up defensively behind the stack of books that she carried close to her chest. I never really thought about that experience, about what it meant. I never really took into account the fact that if she had gotten pregnant just three years earlier, she would have been hard pressed to find a safe place to have an abortion in Topeka, Kansas. Until the Roe v. Wade decision was handed down by the Supreme Court on January 22, 1973, abortion was illegal in most states. In fact, California and Colorado in 1967 were the first states to legalize abortion, but only in certain circumstances, such as pregnancy resulting from rape, incest, Severe handicap or pregnancies that threatened the life of the mother. In 1970, uh, New York became a, a, one of the first states to give abortion access the way that the Supreme Court would do later on. So, what was it that led me, when I was 16 years old, to become radicalized about reproductive freedom? Well, I had attended my first political rally, uh, Take Back the Night. Remember those? Women Unite! Take Back the Night! <laughs> it was great. We marched down the streets of Topeka, Kansas, in one of the uh, neighborhoods considered most dangerous to women, just demanding women's right to be able to walk down the street at any time of day or night, wearing whatever they wanted, without fear of being assaulted. So I went to that rally, and I uh, went to the, the tables that they had set up afterwards and went to a NAWAL table, a National Abortion Rights uh, uh, League, and I got a, I signed up for their, it wasn't an e-letter, I signed up for their newsletter, I got a big pro-choice button, um, and, I, and, I, and I became radicalized to reproductive choice. So what happened when I was 16 that my eyes were awakened to that? Well, when I was 16, I came out as a lesbian. And it was like a revelation. It was like the ugly duckling seeing the swans flying overhead. I'm like, that's where I belong. Because all my life, I felt as if I didn't belong. I, didn't, I couldn't figure out why. When I was 16 and I discovered that, I just flew out of the closet. I was so happy. I just came, I mean, I'm like, hello, world. Here I am. <laughs> and when I finally came skidding to a halt, I had another revelation that not everybody was as happy as I was about my sexual identity. I had found my tribe, but not everybody was happy about that. There were, in fact, laws against me in 1978. And the paranoia was so great that when I stepped foot inside the Topeka lesbian community, 
for the first time. I learned about them when I was 16, this group of lesbians. They were like in their like maybe 20s and 30s, and they met, I don't remember if they met weekly or monthly, but they met regularly, and I would just drive by. Like, I'm pretty sure they met in a Unitarian Universalist church. <laughs> I would just drive by and think, they're my tribe, but I was afraid to go in because I was a minor. But I would do weird things because I was a weird child, like leave balloons on the windshields and little notes saying, gay is good and we are everywhere. And uh, the minute I turned 18, I, I went to my first meeting and the first thing they asked me for was my ID <laughs> because they were afraid that I might be a minor and that I might have parents who might press charges. Coming out as a lesbian and feeding the state-sanctioned oppression of my attraction to women made me realize how the government had colonized my body, had set up a little mini-government on my flesh without consulting me. And that made me see how all women's bodies were colonized by the government. How the U.S. government set up checkpoints on our bodies and they were the ones who had access to who gets to decide what happens with our women's bodies. The United Methodist Church this past week colonized, continued to colonize the bodies of their queer ministers and members, asking them in, in essence to hide behind a curtain like Fanny had to do. You can paint, we just don't want to see you. You can be members of our church, you just can't be out. So the government sets up checkpoints on our bodies, congregations, denominations set up checkpoints on our bodies, and guess who gets to decide? Well, it wasn't the women. It was predominantly male legislators that said, we get to tell you what you can and cannot do with your body. Then the Supreme Court granted women the right to take control over their bodies in Roe v. Wade, 1973. And on that night, when I signed up with NARAL, we had only had legal access to our bodies for five years. Now it's through 46. Yet ever since that ruling, conservatives, many of those who mark, check the box marked Christian on forums that ask for the religious affiliation, have been determined to undermine and eventually overturn Roe v. Wade. Just last week, the Department of Health and Human Services released the final version of its new regulations for Title X programs, which will ban federal family planning funds from going to health providers who perform or refer patients for abortion, abortion services. It's like a domestic gag rule. This means funding cut for Planned Parenthood, even though abortions make up only 3% of the services they perform. Just over three years ago in Colorado Springs, I witnessed with horror, as our city did, an attack on our Planned Parenthood clinic by a domestic terrorist who had been brainwashed by the cult of anti-choice religionists just as surely as jihadists are brainwashed by the leaders of that twisted version of Islam. And that domestic terrorist killed three people who, guess what, neither worked at Planned Parenthood nor had plans to have an abortion there. With these physical and legislative attacks continuing to escalate, it is indeed time to talk about the spirituality of choice, the importance of choice, and why we must stand together to ensure women continue to have access to their own bodies and decisions about their own bodies. When I speak of choice, of course, we all think of Roe v. Wade and how that paved the way for women to have access to safe legal abortions. But the reality is there, there has always been choice. It's just been a harder and more dangerous choice to make. Women throughout the centuries have sought ways to end unwanted pregnancies. In 1891, German playwright Frank Weidkin wrote the play Spring Awakening, where the main character, a 14-year-old girl named Wendla, becomes pregnant after being raped in 1891, gets a back alley, illegal abortion, and dies. Legalizing abortions didn't mean that suddenly young girls and women were having them. It meant that they didn't have to risk their lives in order to obtain one. According to the website ourbodiesourselves.org, 
You know the great book, remember that book, oh, Bodies yes. Ourselves? <laughs> Fabulous. They still, they were still here. According to their website, the estimates of numbers of illegal abortions in the United States during the 50s and 60s ranged from 200,000 to 1.2 million per year of illegal abortions during the 50s and 60s. Prior to Roe v. Wade, as many as 5,000 women died annually as a direct result of unsafe abortions. According to the World Health Organization, 70,000 die of unsafe abortions each year now, mainly in developing countries without access to safe procedures. But here in the US, it's just 0.6 for every 100,000 abortions because we have access to safe legal abortions. Giving women the right to choose what happens with their own bodies is completely in line with our first principle of Unitarian Universalism, the inherent worth and dignity of every human, and our fourth, the free and responsible search for truth and meaning. However, make no mistake, there has always been choice, but even with safe legal options, choice hasn't been free from that trope of shame that many in society insist women wear when their choice is abortion. It's hard for people even in liberal circles to share about that choice. A couple years ago, I was talking about that with some women from my church, and uh, two of them had had abortions that they privately confided to me, but didn't feel comfortable sharing in the larger group of Unitarian Universalists. I remember uh, that, that old show, that old TV show, Party of Five, did any of you ever watch that? I love that show. Five orphans kind of running a restaurant, their parents had died, and, and one of them was a, a teenager who had gotten pregnant and had made the choice to have an abortion. And she said in this episode, no one will ever look at my boyfriend and whisper, do you know what he did? And even though they broached the subject, even then, they couldn't go through with it, and she miscarried and didn't have to have the abortion mm -hmm. because it's so hard. There is no shame for her boyfriend. There is no shame for the boyfriend of, of my junior high cheerleader friend all those years ago, just her, who got whispered after in the halls. Mm -hmm. And try as we might to make it so, men are simply not as inherently accountable as women are for the whole experience of pregnancy, birth, and childbearing, or abortion, they really do have a choice. So often, even when women choose a procedure that is legal and safe, they have to deal with the shame and guilt society tries to foist on them, and deserved though it is. In reality, what the anti-choice movement is lifting up is not shaming women for having an abortion, but shaming women for being sexually active something which is taken for granted in men to the extent that at one of my niece's high school graduations, a young woman was pointed out to me as she crossed the stage to get her diploma. She was kicked off the cheerleading squad because she got pregnant, my sister told me. Mm -hmm. I asked about her quarterback boyfriend. Did he get kicked off the team? No. This mindset is chillingly portrayed in Margaret Atwood's book and now a TV reality show on Hulu. The Handmaid's Tale. Mm -hmm. One scene in particular depicts the cultural shaming that exists in our society today. She writes, 32 comes during testifying. It's Janine telling about how she was gang raped at 14 and had an abortion. But whose fault was it, Aunt Helena says, holding up one plump finger. Her fault, her fault, her fault, we chant in unison. <coughs> Who let them on? She did, she did, she did. Why did God allow such a terrible thing? Teach her a lesson, teach her a lesson, teach her a lesson. We hear statements like these today. Who remembers U.S. Senate candidate Todd Atkins saying during the 2012 election cycle that legitimate rape rarely results in pregnancy? As if A, there is such thing as a legitimate rape, <coughs> and B, your body knows that a violent sexual act has occurred and so compassionately chooses not to allow you to become pregnant. How do you know if a rape is illegitimate? I guess if you get pregnant, which just goes to show that the opposite of pro-choice isn't pro-life. It's anti-woman. Mm -hmm. And it's anti-choice. 
This isn't about a medical procedure, it's about controlling women's bodies. A patriarchal strategy used through centuries through forced marriages, control over finances, and control over women's bodies. As Adeline Rich said, there is nothing revolutionary whatsoever about the control of women's bodies by men. The woman's body is the terrain on which the patriarchy is erected. The fact that this isn't really about saving unborn children becomes crystal clear when you realize that the majority of those who oppose abortion also oppose programs that would create a quality life for the children once they are born. As Thomas Friedman puts it, in my world, you don't get to call yourself pro-life and be against common sense gun control, like banning public access to the kind of semi-automatic assault rifle designed for warfare that was used recently in a Colorado theater. You don't get to call yourself pro-life and want to shut down the Environmental Protection Agency, which ensures clean air and clean water. Clean water, which is a universal human right, prevents childhood asthma, preserves the biodiversity, and com combats climate change that could disrupt every life on the planet. You don't get to call yourself pro-life and oppose programs like Head Start, which I'm a proud graduate of. I trace my doctorate of ministry directly back to my Head Start experience, which provides basic education, health, and nutrition for the most disadvantaged children. The term pro-life should be a shorthand for respect for the sanctity of life, but I will not let that label apply to people for whom sanctity of life begins at conception and ends at birth. What about the rest of life? Respect for the sanctity of life, if you believe that it begins at conception, cannot end at birth. That's what Anne Lamont spoke of in our reading this morning. Being pro-choice goes beyond choosing whether or not to have an abortion. The concept of choice is a sacred idea. It's a holy act. To be responsible for our own lives. To think with care and compassion about what's best for every area of our lives, regardless of gender. Not just pregnancy, but to treat with awe the choices we must make in our lives. Pro-choice is a spiritual stance that affirms our connection to the interdependent web of existence of which we are all a part. It calls us to our highest selves. It trusts us with our own bodies. Mm -hmm. I think it's ironic that coming out as a lesbian, which means, short of anything of rape, I would never need to worry about an accidental pregnancy. <laughs> it would be difficult, but that is what radicalized me to the pro-choice movement. A friend once told me, a straight woman, she said, as a straight woman, birth control is always on your mind during your reproductive years. You're always thinking about it. But the reality is that a woman's right to reproductive freedom is all of our concern. Lesbian, bi, trans, straight, queer, asexual, in relationships or not, it's all of our concern. I've known that from the moment I participated in that Take Back the Night Valley in 1978. In 2004, I was a part of the Colorado delegation at the March for Women's Lives in Washington, D.C. Every year on March 9th, National Abortion Provider Appreciation Day, I gather up a group of people, and we go to our local Planned Parenthood, which has now been rebuilt, with flowers and candy and balloons and a card, to thank them for being on the front line, for providing such a crucial service. If you want to do that, your closest Planned Parenthood is only eight miles away, in East Orange, 560 Dr. Martin King Boulevard, March 9th. National Abortion Provider Appreciation Day. <laughs> this year, on the anniversary of Roe v. Wade, I participated in a rally supporting Planned Parenthood at the corner of a busy intersection in Colorado Springs. There were people from my congregation, from the Colorado Springs feminists, from the students from a local college, and we all were on all four corners holding up signs, uh, celebrating a woman's right to choose, saying we trust women with their bodies. And it was great. We, 
we uh, got uh, lots of people honking horns in support and giving us the thumbs up and we were like, wow, and I was forced for two days afterwards because I was shouting so much. But there were also a lot of thumbs down. And in some of those cars, there were children. <coughs> young children. And as their parents would give us the thumbs down or make predictions where we'd be living once we were dead, I would just smile at those children in those cars and I would hold my sign up higher. And in my heart, I said, may you remember this. May you remember this moment at this corner, though your mom is giving a thumbs down. May you remember this if you ever need it. May you remember this. If ever one day a friend comes up to you and says, I'm pregnant, or my girlfriend is, may you remember this, this sacred act of a group of people standing on a corner saying you have the right to choose. And may we each remember that as we celebrate Women's History Month, as we determine to meet head on the assault to women's rights. Let us be bold, fearless, and strong, and unapologetic in our pro-choice stance, in our fight for women's rights, and let us teach our young folk, particularly our young women, about the power of their bodies, the beauty of their sexuality, the strength of their voices, and the deeply spiritual nature of their right to choose. May it be so.